Rivalries go hand in hand with sports. Vikings and Packers, Yankees and Red Sox, Michigan and the Ohio State, Lakers and Celtics, Real Madrid and FC Barcelona. But today we will be discussing one of the greatest, if not the greatest sports rivalries of all time and when it went too far. Today, we are talking about Alabama versus Auburn and one of the most infamous and heinous crimes in sports history. <laughs> I think it sounds good. I've I've just, I I I tried my best. I mean, I just watched the Vikings game yesterday, and that was just it was uh, a lot. It was a lot. The first half, I went through so many emotions. I put like Bailey's in my coffee. Oh no! I was eating ice cream out of like the carton. <laughs> okay. I gave myself a stress headache. Um. Half time, I made a uh, mac and cheese. Ooh. I then ate it during the third quarter. The fourth quarter was so insane. Like, this game was so crazy. This was the most craziest game I had ever seen in my entire life. I've been watching <laughs> football since I was, like, c- couldn't, like, understand the game at all. I mean, I barely understand it right now, but, like, <laughs> even more so then. Okay. And somehow, in overtime, the Vikings won. But, like... You, I don't even know how to describe it. Like there are no words to how crazy this game was against the Bills. Was there, um, what was their score before overtime? Um, they were tied. It was thirty oh, thirty, okay. and then Vikings won thirty three thirty. But like the last minute of the game, there was so many turnovers and just like crazy things. Like, right, did they get a touchdown? No, they're short. Okay, <laughs> did they get a touchdown? No, no, they're short. Okay, oh turnover on downs, and then um, b- the Bills fumbled the ball, and the <laughs> Vikings somehow got it, and then they got it in the touch, like in the end zone. So it was a touchdown for the Vikings. So the Bills turned it over in their own end zone, and then the Vikings player got it, and then had possession of it. So it was a Vikings touchdown. So then that made it. <laughs> And then the Bills got, and that was like 40 seconds left of the actual game. And then the Bills got the ball back and they were able to go down the field. And then they were able to get a field goal to tie it up. And that was the end of the game. But then they went to overtime and it was insane. And then the Vikings got a field goal. And then long story short, Bills threw an interception in the end zone. The, and the Vikings came away with it victorious. So the Vikings are now 8 1. I fell on the ground at the end. <laughs> I can imagine. Like, that's a lot. I went through all of the emotions. <laughs> hey, Wanders. Welcome back to another Foolish Wanders podcast, the podcast about anything and everything. Today, we're going to be talking about one of the most famous and heinous crimes in sports history. Woo! Woo! Take it away, Kendra. Okay, so I've been wanting to cover this story for like some time, like a while, since probably we've like maybe the first year into the podcast. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And I just, I really like this story. I think it's weird. It's just, <laughs> I, I just really didn't know the best way to like lay it out, like tell the story. Sure. Um, but I like stories or like instances where like something so heinous or ridiculous happens from something that is so simple or innocent as football. Like the war of the bucket. Yes, like that's fun to me too. The War of the <laughs> yeah. Buckets. That that's a good episode too. I don't that remember what funny. episode that was. Like ridiculous wars. Yeah, I can look it up. But right. uh, so, or like people that are so passionate about something, they take it to an extreme. That's what I I, I like that too. Mm-hmm. So now, before you start poo pooing football, <laughs> like in football fans, remember that I think that everyone has something that they're like completely enthralled or passionate with, like you know for most people yeah yep and for a lot of americans it's football that's just kind of how it is (laughs) 
including Kendra. Yep, and as a Minnesota Vikings fan, I remember, I mean, I have some of that too. I remember when Brett Favre, Green Bay, Green Bay's golden child, former mm-hmm. golden child, was traded to the Vikings. That's, and, yeah. And Packer fans went nuts ballistic, and they had a mock funeral and a casket with a fake Brett Favre body. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep, you can look it up. It's true. It is oh, true. I remember it. And or when the Vikings former running back um, Adrian Peterson was nine yards shy of breaking the NFL single season rushing record of 2,105 yards and a Packer bar poked fun by putting up a sign that said, hey, Adrian, this is what nine yards looks like. And it included the measurements of nine <laughs> yards. And yes, the Vikings have done their fair share to ignite the rivalry Rivalry as well. I remember um, Randy Moss mooning the Packer fans at Lambeau after he caught a touchdown. And it was funny then, and it's still funny now. <laughs> it's still funny now. Okay. It's hilarious. And yes, I have some disgust when I see that green and yellow G logo and yes i made sure mr kendra wasn't a packer fan before dating him and yes i feel some excitement and satisfaction when i grate cheese by hand (laughs) so i do completely understand rivalries but i can't imagine doing some something so heinous as what we're going to talk about today but i can imagine a packer fan doing this oh no i'm joking of course it's a joke i'm kidding so I'm should kidding. we say, like, for people that don't know football or aren't from America, like, why the Vikings don't like the Packers or something? Why don't, don't the pa- why? Well, like, they're, why they're rivals? I don't know we why, we'll ri- why, why we're rivals. It's a, I <laughs> guess it's like... because it's, like, Minnesota, Wisconsin are border states, and we are, the, mm-hmm. pa- the Packers and the Vikings are in the same um, football conference, the NFC oh, North, okay. so we play each other, like, twice a year. And, you know, I mean, we do, you do see, we do run into each other every single day, like fans, right? Oh, and yeah, I remember, like in elementary school, if the Vikings won on Monday, every, all the Vikings fans would wear their Viking jerseys and then we would make fun of the Packer fans. And then, you know, a lot of the time the Packers would win over the Vikings and then that one or two um, students in my class that were Packer fans would get to wear their hideous green jerseys with the yellow whatever so yeah yeah, that's why we hate each other (laughs) that's why we hate each other okay but the rivalry we are talking about today has even more of a reason to like like history of dislike like that goes way back far way further than the vikings and the packers okay so to get into it we are talking about college football and college football is most important in Alabama. Oh my goodness, yeah, down south, football yep. is huge. Mm-hmm. And in Alabama, it is everything. And this is the rivalry that has long defined it. So in Tuscaloosa, Alabama in 2010, in the Iron Bowl, a game Auburn Tiger fans will never forget when Alabama blew a 24-point lead in their own backyard inside Bryant-Denny Stadium. There has there have been so many great Iron Bowl finishes, but the 2010 comeback, as it has been hailed as Auburn quarterback and Heisman Trophy winner Cam Newton, or Scam Newton, as <laughs> Alabama fans call him. More on that later. Okay. He led his team to victory. This game cemented Newton's legacy as a quarterback and will be in highlight reels forever. So months later, on January 27th, 2011, the perpetrator called into the Paul Feinbaum sports radio talk show. It's a show where Alabama and Auburn fans can call to vent their frustrations or, like, brag. And the perpetrator called to confess or brag about his crime, which was presumed to have been driven by Alabama's loss the previous week in the Iron Bowl against Auburn in 2010. I've got the the um, original audio from it right here, so I can play it. Al is in Dadeville, Alabama. Hey, Al. <clears throat> hey, Paul. How you doing? Well, thanks. Um, when Bear Bryant died, I was living in Texas, and I really didn't understand the Alabama-Auburn rivalry. Uh, but a good friend of mine that lived in uh, Birmingham sent me a copy of the newspaper, showing the uh, Auburn 
students rolling Tumor's Corner celebrating Bryant's death. Now stop, 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 stop. I, 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 even though I know what you just got through saying, and even though I know you're quoting from a newspaper, I, I just have the most difficult time ever believing that Auburn students rolled Tumor's Corner when the news broke that Coach Bryant died. Does anyone else remember that? I don't. Do you want me to send you a copy of? I still have a newspaper clipping. Well, I mean, I'm I'm kind of awkward here because I'm not doubting your your truthfulness. I'm just. Are, are, are you guys in the other room in as much shock as I am? That, that, that is just one of the most shocking things I've ever heard. I, I, do, I do not want to believe that is true. Okay, let me finish my story. Okay. This year I was at the uh, Iron Bowl. There's no way that could be true. Well, okay. This year I was at the Iron Bowl. Okay. And I saw where they put a Scam Newton jersey on Bear Bryant's statue. Okay, and again, that's 28 years later. Okay. Well, let me tell you what I did. The weekend after the Iron Bowl... I went to Auburn, Alabama, because I lived 30 miles away, sure. and I poisoned the two tumors trees. Okay, well, that's fair. I put Spike 80 DL in them. Did they die? Do what? Did they die? They're not dead yet, but they, they, will they, they, they definitely will die. Is that against the, the, the law to poison a tree? Well, do you think I care? Mm, no. Okay, I really don't. Okay. Roll down tide. I love the outro music. It's so jazzy. That was a commercial. But yeah, so oh, everybody man. remember that call. I know that he used like a lot of weird um words that maybe not a lot of people or, or terms that maybe not a lot of people are familiar with, like mm-hmm. rolling and tumor trees and Bryant statue. So we're gonna break all that down, but just remember that call. So somebody called in anonymously to the uh, to the Auburn and Alabama sports radio show and said that he poisoned some trees. So we're gonna tell you why that's a big deal. Oh no! Already, Katrina, what do you think? Poisoning trees. <laughs> well, one that's horrible, but two is are these like memorial trees? We will. We they're a little bit more than that. We will get. We will break oh, it down. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, why would an Alabama fan poison some trees? And why was it such a huge blow to Auburn and their fans? So, in eastern Alabama lies Auburn University, which is considered to be one of the most beautiful campuses in the country. One reason being is it has over 135 species of trees on campus. The campus is very well known for its nature and sprawling campus, But of all the spots in campus and the city of Auburn lies its most recognizable landmark, Toomer's Corner. So Toomer's Corner is at the intersection of College Street and Magnolia Avenue in the heart of the city of Auburn. With Toomer's Drugs, an Auburn landmark since 1896, facing what has since 1896 been the anchoring corner of Auburn's campus. So Toomer's Corner is the center of campus and city life. And at the gateway, two large oak trees once stood, only 80 feet from one another. The heart and soul of Auburn's campus, the Toomer's Oaks. So they were over like 80 years. I've also seen like they were 135 years old. Oh, wow. So very old trees. Um, The destination, so Toomer's Oaks were the destination for countless thousands of fans who engage in the long-standing tradition of rolling Toomer's Corner, which is a celebration occurring after every significant Auburn sports victory. It goes back to the 1970s, and whenever Auburn wins, students would rush to Toomer's Corner and throw toilet paper up into the trees. (laughs) So the original Toomer's Oaks, when rolled, looked like otherworldly and magical and made from pounds and pounds of toilet paper. So usually the the oaks are rolled for Auburn victories, but they have been rolled on occasions their arch nemesis, the University of Alabama, loses. Okay, so I get what rolls meant. I thought like they meant they were like rolling up the sidewalk or something. <laughs> but okay, I, toilet yeah, paper yep, roll. Yep. And then, okay. Uh, <laughs> so know. saying these two teams hate each other is an understatement. And we're going to get into their origins in a little bit, but I've got some pictures of Toomer's Corner, the original when it was rolled, and the the pictures of them. I think it's like, I think it's kind of beautiful. It kind of, it looks like snow, kind of. Yeah, it looks like snow in the south. Yeah, kind of heavenly. Look, I mean, like, 
and at night it, it kind of looks like halloween decorations are yeah, like I was gonna very say, it's a little bit eerie yeah kinda... eerie kind of like ethereal with the just like flowing long strands <laughs> But look, I mean, look how many fans would do this. Look how many people it's are like in hundreds this. Hundreds of people. Yeah, hundreds of people. So this is a tradition. So this, these trees are icons. So if this was, if this was to happen in 2020, would this be like blasphemous because you're wasting so much toilet paper? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good go point. outside and, and grab a roll. Mm-hmm. Okay. So where does this rivalry that divides the state come from? So these are questions that should have answers, but there isn't one answer that brings clarity to the rivalry that exists between the University of Alabama and Auburn University. So to get to the origin, we have to go back a hundred plus years to the Civil War. Wow. So during the Civil War, the federal government, so the Union, the Union of the United States, not the Confederate States, but mm-hmm. the federal government decides to fund something called land-grant universities. And these are schools that teach farming and mechanical trades. So basically, agriculture schools or like Aggie schools. Cool. Mm-hmm. So when the former Confederate states join back with the Union, the state of Alabama wants in on the government money. So then there's a decision that has to be made. What school will get all this government money? And it turns into a competition, right? Yeah, sadly, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the University of Alabama wants to be the land-grant school. And the last thing they want is a little school in East Alabama, Auburn, (laughs) to get the federal money. So this is the two schools' first head-to-head competition. So Auburn, a little Methodist college out in the boondocks, wins over the older and more affluent University of Alabama. And bam, the rivalry is born. So, how do two in-state rival schools settle the score of who's better? Football. So, not academic, but sport. <laughs> yes, because this, no, okay. yes, this is America, and we don't care about <laughs> academics. Sadly, we, yeah. we care about football. Okay, so this rivalry, but it is about money and class and politics all rolled into one. But it immediately manifests itself onto the football field and into the stands. And at its heart, it is about class. Auburn was once considered as the hick school. Aww. And but today Auburn is ranked higher than Alabama, and Auburn grads in average make more than Alabama grads. I was and in actual oh sorry go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, like I heard of Auburn a lot more than Alabama. Really? Yeah, like, I hear Auburn all the time, but I don't really hear, like, University of Alabama. That's Yeah, because Auburn has sent six astronauts into space. That's probably why. <laughs> and um, the current CEO of Apple, Tim Cook, attended Auburn. Huh, nice. So it's a kind of a fun word to say, Auburn. 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 I think of the hair. No, I think yeah. of the hair color. That's what I think of. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It sounds prestigious. Auburn. Auburn. <laughs> Okay, so the rivalry gets so intense and poisonous that fights break out onto the field and in the stands one too many times. And they suspend the games between the two schools for 40 years. Oh, dang. So this is happening, like, in the 1900s, like the early 1900s. (laughs) These are the fights. This isn't happening, like, 20 or 30 years ago. This is happening, like, in the 1900s. a long time ago. Yes. (laughs) Okay, so Alabama and Auburn have faced each other a total of 85 times throughout the years, so dating back to 1893. And after they met in 1907, the on-field meetings for the two teams actually took a pause for a few decades because, you know, (laughs) the fights. And they started playing again in 1948. That's just, these are just crazy, like, dates numbers to me like that's how long this rivalry goes back yeah deep-seated hatred Mm -hmm. so it actually took an active state government (laughs) a house joint resolution to resume games between these two teams that's sad and the two teams pick back right where they left off of course back to hating each other like 40 years never went by and generations didn't go by with it what the heck you you know how like many people graduated from these colleges in this time 
time span. And there isn't like TV or YouTube to like replay any of this. True. It's like, just the like games. Word of mouth. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay, so part of the reason college football is so important to the state could also be like that Alabama doesn't have a professional sports team. Oh, like the Vikings? Yeah. So they okay. don't have football. They don't have hockey. They don't have basketball. They don't have it or baseball either. They don't have any professional sports teams. Wow. Which means you only have two choices, Alabama or Auburn, and you must choose. The most intense rivalry in all of college football, a brother versus brother battle, dividing families and friends, and once a year on Thanksgiving Day weekend, they meet in a game known simply as the Iron Bowl. <laughs> now I need like, dun, 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 dun. like it's just like cheering and <sighs> I need like drums or like some explosions <laughs> or something. Okay. The Iron Bowl. Nowhere in the United States is that more true than in the heart of Dixie, where the Alabama Crimson Tide face in state rivals the Auburn Tigers in the Iron Bowl. The Iron Bowl gets its name from when it was played in Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham is the center for Alabama's iron and steel production. The two teams met in Birmingham in 1893 for the first Iron Bowl, which Auburn won 32-22. to And in 1907, remember, the series was suspended until 1948. So no other game comes close to the animosity of the Iron Bowl. Nowhere else in college football is there such love for one's team and pure hatred for the other. Perhaps what makes this rivalry so great, unlike Texas and Oklahoma or the Ohio State and Michigan, is that these two teams are in the same state, and fans of these two opposing teams work and even live together. In fact, if one Auburn and Alabama fan marry each other, it is referred to as mixed marriage. That's messed up. I mean... I, I know it's like kind of a joke, about, but like I've heard <laughs> jokes about like Packer and Viking fans too. Like I've seen flags mm-hmm. that they buy where they're like there's one side's Vikings <laughs> and the other side's Packers, and it says a house divided. Oh, I have seen those. Yeah. But then I think of the Al- the um not Alabama quote the Abraham Lincoln quote a house divided cannot stand, and yeah. I go. Mm-hmm. Kind of depends, yeah. True. And that's why I made sure Mr. Kendrell wasn't a Packer fan. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, honestly though. But is he? He's not really into sports, though, is he? Kinda? He has a Randy Moss jersey that he's had before I met him, and he has Viking stuff. He oh, will okay. sit there and he will watch and he will cheer when things get exciting, very much <laughs> like my father. I think it's yeah. kind of true. You can be like Kendra, you're a weird forty and or whatever, but I do think that you end up marrying some version of your parent. Yeah, you do. Yes, and you it's do. like very proven that like mm-hmm. men marry a version of their mom. They find somebody that's kind of like their acts like their mom. Interesting. And then yeah, and you find I've heard that like females find somebody that looks like their dad usually. I don't or, think like, Mr. Kinder looks like my dad. Do you think that little that Englishman German <laughs> German man looks like that my dad who is looks very Finnish? I have to see them like side by side because I haven't seen that in a while. But Dude, I don't, don't think so. You. No way. Mr. Kendra has a beard. My dad can't grow well, a beard. Yeah. Well, that's, that's not the whole point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he cannot grow a beard. He he's can't. Not he's Finnish. He can't grow a beard. <laughs> Is that a thing? I think it's like a stereotype, like joke thing. Oh, okay. But I'm sure Finns can grow beards, but just, you I'm know, sure. it's like the majority is just like Finns can't grow beards. They have no hair. <laughs> okay. Where were we? Mixed marriage? Yeah. <laughs> Mixed marriage. <laughs> Okay, back to the animosity. Okay, so the Iron Bowl is not like other rivalries in the sense that Alabama and Auburn fans see each other every day. That's not always the case with many other rivalries. In no other rivalry do opposing fans come in contact with each other as much as they do in Alabama. The state is basically shut down for this game. Highways are empty, stores are shut down, and the winner or losers get bragging right or not losers <laughs> the lovers i put lovers for some reason i thought it, I, I maybe it was lovers. just like too much like venom in this and like the, this hate i was like love oh yeah. lovers sprinkle it in like that taylor swift song love it i don't like that. sometimes <laughs> i like that song and sometimes i don't 
Yeah. I like to I like to laugh at it. it. Yeah. Especially where she's like, it's almost like a baby. It makes me laugh. whatever. Okay, back to the. <laughs> that was a good rant. <laughs> Thank you. The state is shut down for this game, okay? And the winner okay. gets bragging rights for the rest of the year. And some call in to the Paul Feinbaum show, like the Auburn Tree Crip, like the Auburn Tree Killer. <laughs> That's what we should do it. I'm sorry. The just, podcast. <laughs> it just makes it's this Auburn Tree Killer. It's like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or something. The Auburn That'd be Tree funny. Killer. Um, yeah, that's that's the title. Or a man named Harvey Updike. Oh, they actually found the actual person. Oh yeah. Okay. So what makes a man kill two innocent iconic trees? Like that's some insane like animosity. We're gonna get into this. Oh no. Is his, like, wife part of that team or something? Is that what cows him? We'll kind of get into it. Oh, no. (laughs) Am I right? (laughs) No, not really. But we will get into some stuff of his family, okay? Okay. Okay, so the man who called himself, remember from the radio call, Al from Dadeville phoned the Feinbaum show on January 27th to make the claim in apparent retaliation for what he believed were misdeeds by Auburn fans as far back as the 1980s. Let it let it go, man. Yeah, take a frozen. take a beat from Elsa. <laughs> yeah. Okay, oh. so the phone call was tracked and the perpetrator, Harvey Updike, was arrested. Updike, formerly of Dadeville, Alabama, Updike was incarcerated for six months and was um, ordered to pay nearly $800,000 in restitution for poisoning the historic trees. But it was clear that he isn't feeling much remorse for his crime. Quote, I wish I had not killed those trees just so I could do it again. End quote. Is he okay? Like, do we need to go check out? We're like, gonna get oh, into this. You, you, you jump like, to conclude. You jump, you jump, you jump. I jump. Yes, I do. <laughs> you jump, you jump, you jump. Okay, so you jump, you jump, you jump, you jump. Okay, so as a precaution, Auburn University took soil samples the next day and sent them back to the Alabama State Pesticide Residue Laboratory on campus for analysis. Results came back that Wednesday confirming the man's allegations. Could you imagine how, like, heart-wrenching that would be? You know, like, these trees are going to die and you're just, you can't do much. Oh, yeah. And considering that this campus is famous for their trees and their horticulture um, degree is, or, sent like, degree, what is it? Degree building, whatever, is big. Uh, like, it's, it gets a big deal. Their programs? Or, like, yes. Their, uh, that's okay. a better word. <laughs> program. Like, their colleges. Their horticulture whatever. college is big. Okay. Okay, so Harvey told Feinbaum... Auburn students had rolled Tumor's Corner after learning of famed football coach Paul Bear Bryant's death in the early 1980s. He was also upset at seeing a Cam Newton jersey on the Bear Bryant statue at the Alabama campus. Okay, so what's the big deal about that, right? Like, who cares? It's just a statue. So now we have to talk about an icon for Alabama. The University of Alabama, that is. And it's not trees. (laughs) <laughs> it's a man named Bear Bryant. Actually, his name is Paul Bear Bryant, but at, when he was 13 years old, he wrestled a bear at a carnival, and that's how he got his nickname. So that's the kind of ne- guy we are working with. We are working with, like, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Rambo, <laughs> John Wayne, like, okay. Rocky Balboa, Bear Bryant. Like, he wrestled a bear. <laughs> at 13 at 13 so bear bryant is considered to be one of the best coaches ever ever okay so this is a quote even his peers in the coaching business felt in awe of him he had such charisma he was just a giant figure so if anyone really says that about you as a compliment like that's like the nicest thing a person could say about oh yeah you right mm-hmm. okay so he Um, Bear Bryant was even awarded the Medal of Freedom by President Reagan in, like, the 1980s after he died. So that's a huge deal. That's how, like, monumental this guy was. Hmm. So he was distinguished by his houndstooth um, hat that he wore on the sidelines. So (laughs) maybe you don't know anything about Alabama football and you've never really heard of Bear Bryant, but if you've seen the movie Forrest Gump... And you remember Forrest went to the University of Alabama and he played football. And if do you remember seeing a coach on the sidelines with a houndstooth weird fedora? 
well, I don't remember it that well. All right. Well, I do, and that was Bear Bryant. <laughs> okay. okay. That's cool. So, mm-hmm. so Bryant molded teams in his image, focusing on aggressive defense and execution on special teams. As a player at Alabama, Bryant demonstrated his toughness by playing against Tennessee with a broken leg. Dangerous. No, don't do that. He was I so mean- <laughs> I know. He was so popular in Alabama, he had his own TV show. The Bear Bryant Show was a weekly coaches show that served as a weekly recap of the Alabama Crimson Tide football team's previous day's game. The show ran during the tenure of Coach Paul um, Bear Bryant from 19- 1958 through 1982. Wow. And who was so enamored with Bear Bryant? <laughs> Harvey Updike. The tree killer. <laughs> <laughs> Like a lot of fans, Bryant gave him someone to look up to. Harvey told Feinbaum Auburn students had rolled Toomer's Corner after learning of um, Paul Bear Bryant's death in the early 1980s. He was also upset at seeing Cam Newton's jersey on the Bear Bryant statue at Alabama's campus. I mean, that is disrespectful, Mm -hmm. you know, to, like, celebrate, like, the great figures. Yeah. If they did, there is no real proof that we can find, but that's what he's saying. So, you know. okay. It's a hearsay. It's, yeah. Okay. So, that was Harvey's tipping point. At that point, he justified to himself that his team and his icon had been wronged by the jokes and actions of others. It was time to act in defense of his beloved icon. Harvey is such a huge Alabama fan. He has, quote, children 30 years old named Bear Bryant and Crimson Tide. Crimson (laughs) likes her name and Bear likes his name. I mean. Uh, (laughs) Updike goes on to say that, quote, my baby girl, I wanted to name her Allie Bama. No, that is Crimson true. Crimson Tide's better. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but Crimson Tide I is awesome. I just can't justify and... naming a girl Crimson Tide because of oh, what well... happens once a month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I didn't even think about that. I did. But, like, roll growing... Tide, roll! <laughs> roll Tide! No. Crimson Tide. Okay, this is all right. So, yeah, so back to his quote I wanted to name her Allie Bama. That is true. Call her Allie or call her Bama. My new wife said, you don't, you done ruined the other two. You're not ruining this one. Oh, he has three kids. I think or... so. It's hard to know because it's, a, you know. Okay. But also, this is another quote of Harvey Updike. There are three <laughs> things Harvey Updike doesn't like in this world. Auburn, liver, and cats. Sounds like a good man. I also <laughs> saw that um Harvey's dad died when he was young. like. Like four or five years old. Oh, so I mean, he probably replaced Bear Bryant since he watched him growing up. This TV show, he probably replaced him as his father figure. Yeah, I can and see that. kind yeah. of watching this next slide, I have a picture of the Scam Newton, sorry Cam Newton's jersey on Bear Bryant is kind of like disrespecting his sort of daddy <laughs> it's just taped on there too it's just like I sadly mean, taped yeah it's just it's not that well executed is it could have at least like gotten a bigger one and like sewed it but yeah, yeah. So, okay so now we're gonna kind of get into the science behind obsession Ooh, ooh, is right we're pretty deep <laughs> we're di- we're dipping more than our big toes in this one today katrina ooh. we're putting all four of not four of them five of them in <laughs> do you have four toes no i have five but you know. okay good <laughs> i only have nine i only have nine toenails though really? eight toenails i only really have eight toenails you don't have them on your pinky toes no i paint them on wait actually yes i paint them on oh, i didn't know that they don't really grow like it, it it will grow like a little bit and then i'll like just cut it and just get rid of it <laughs> Like it, like okay. it's like, and then everyone's like, "Well, why are you cutting off your toenails?" I can't, like, they're just like that pitiful that it's just, it just is like, <laughs> it just pays to have eight. Okay, I mean, paint them on. Okay, there you go. The more you know <laughs> about me. Da, da, da. Like, <laughs> <laughs> the little star. Has only eight toenails <laughs> instead of ten. <laughs> That's gonna be the outro song. No, oh, God. <laughs> 
All right, the science behind obsession, psychology behind fandom. Like, so remember, fan, like, fanatic mm-hmm. is a fan, yeah. but it's just a crazier fan. Yep. Okay, so the psychology behind fandom was first written about in 1956 by Donald Horton and R. Richard Wool. The academic paper was, quote, mass communications and parasocial interaction, observations on intimacy at a distance. Horton and Wall discuss in the piece the emotional bond that develops between fans and their focus. It can be sports, movie stars, stage actors, even politics. Parasocial interaction occurs when the fan feel a bond when the fans feel a bond and attachment for their star or team to the point of creating an emotional intimate bond without any true reciprocity of feelings from the team or star. So, where parasocial interactions can get dangerous is when fanatics become so extreme in their fandom that they feel the need to personally defend a team or player's honor. Hence the stabbings and tree poisoning. Wait, stabbings? Well, like, I don't know if there were stabbings, but we'll just add stabbings. (laughs) We're just gonna sprinkle that in there. Well, take stab- okay, let's take stabbings out, and there were fights- in yeah. the early 1900s, and probably still now a little bit. So we're just oh, going to sure, say yeah. punchings. Hence punchings. the punchings <laughs> and tree punching. poisoning have justification to the performer of the crime. Okay. Wasn't it was it Taylor Swift that had um, a stalker? I think ended up at her house. Probably. I just like, I, Whenever I think of Taylor Swift, I always just think of her, like, hiding in those trunks. Oh, to get from, like, backstage to... Or like, from her apartment to a car. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah, really sad, there was one actually. where she was in a suitcase. Oh, <laughs> allegedly, allegedly, <laughs> allegedly. Okay. Don't come for me, Harvey. Uh, back to psychology. We went to California for a second. We're back now. We're back to Alabama. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> so Harvey Updike is a cookie cutter display of parasocial interaction. He honestly believed that the quote prank he pulled would be more would be justification for wrongs done to the University of Alabama and more importantly its icon Bear Bryant. See there's a, a huge difference between like a prank and crime. Like a prank should be funny, like lighthearted, not like someone's gonna get hurt. Yeah, by poisoning yeah, yeah. the ground. We'll get into that a little bit in a little okay. bit. Okay. okay, so Updike had to defend Alabama and showing his support by killing the tumor trees. And that was his ticket to stardom. No, you didn't have to do that. So why else call a nationally syndicated show and tell the world what had been accomplished if he wasn't looking for glory? Updike had hit a level of where he was proud of what he had allegedly accomplished and it was time for him to take his stage. See, isn't that interesting? Because, like, that's what ser- some serial killers will do, too. Like, they're proud of what they've done. And, like, like the Zodiac like, Killer. Thought. Yeah, the Zodiac yeah, like, Killer. They have, like, little, like, little hints or, like, they'll call the police or, like, yep. they'll do stuff to, like, try to get caught. I think they want to get caught in the end. I think they get to, yeah. like, in the end end. Not in the beginning, but in the end end. Yeah. I think they've just become, I don't know, too consumed. They fame. Like, yeah. They too want- consumed by themselves that they just want yeah. it to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so more on the murder of the trees. So this is more about the actual crime itself. More in-depth um, insight from the Auburn tree killer. Harvey <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, quote, it took me a month, he explained. Every night I stayed up all night long. They used to have cameras on the trees. I figured out when the slowest time was, what day of the week, what hour of the night was the slowest around those oak trees. So I could go in there at that time and not get caught. For the record, the time was for Sunday morning. And That's he was so sad. And he was armed with Spike 80 DF, which is a herbicide. I mixed it with water and put it in milk jugs, he explained. I had two milk jugs for each tree. I walked around the outside of the tree where the foliage came out. When they arrested me, they came to my house and they brought, I'm not lying to you, 25 police cars to search my house. They told me I used way, way, way too much. As it turns out, he used 500 times the lethal amount to kill the trees. 500 times. And the city of Auburn was deeply concerned he might have poisoned the water table. 
Well, yeah. So no the shit. city, so the city's water might have been poisoned. Oh, like, dude, you gotta think a little bit bigger. Like you, like you gotta think it through, my guy. And like, then, like, just... like they asked him like five hundred times. He's like, "I'm not a chemist." <laughs> it doesn't take a chemist to know like two gallon two jugs. Milk jugs for each tree. <laughs> For each freaking tree, dude. For each tree. <laughs> and like, I'm sorry, but like, who stays up for a month? Like, w- like, where's your wife? What is she doing? Like, is she I like, think- why aren't you? He's home? been married I like twice, hurt. I think, and divorced twice. Oh my goodness! But like, w- w- you need a life. You need a job. You need a hobby that's not killing trees. It's yeah. Why productive. would he just be like the president of like a, the Alabama fan club or something and have or like, something? Have like, like a potluck or something? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to think of something more like you know positive than being like, like making an association a, yeah. to like preserve like Bear's name, right? Like Bear Bryant's name, like make it a positive thing. He not... did. He named his son it. But that's not no. <laughs> that's not. Well, I mean, like yeah, cool. Name your son after it, but like make like a like teach young kids how to play football. Like do something supportive like that don't anyways okay continue (laughs) okay so this is a quote from him i wanted Mm. auburn people to hate me as much as i hate them that's what he told cbs news i think he accomplished it i think he might (laughs) have so so after the trees were poisoned expert poured activated carbon into the soil around the two trees at the corner of college street at magnolia avenue on wednesday in an effort to keep the poison from penetrating the trees they planned to spray a coating on the leaves um, to help retain moisture and thus avoiding drawing water and more herbicide, like up to the roots, you know, because how they're going to okay. absorb, like, absorb yeah. everything. Okay. And efforts to save them were unsuccessful. Hmm. So basically, this poison starves the trees to death. Oh. They're not able to take in nutrients. That's what this hmm. herbicide stuff does. It starves them slowly doesn't kill oh. them right away they starve slowly that's really sad yeah and i saw a lot of um really sad um interviews of like the horticulturist and like tree specialists mm. from the university and a lot of them were really sad it sounded like they were talking about like a person that died yeah well, instead there's of like trees there's studies too that um like if you talk positively or negatively to a plant like they actually respond either like the trees you speak like positive to oh, sorry the trees you speak or plants you speak to like positively and give affirmations to and you're like hey how's it going play happy music they're green and beautiful but the ones that you like yell at and like make feel horrible they wither and they don't grow Aww. <laughs> like it's actually a thing that's kind of so, cool it is cool, but it also makes this a lot sadder because what if, I don't know, something... They should have know. played Lover by Taylor Swift and then... That could have helped the trees. Honestly, yeah, though. Like, positive music. Yeah. Taylor Swift oh. lover. There you go. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, so... Efforts to save the trees were unsuccessful. The corner was eventually restored with untainted soil. So they had to replace the soil. They had to take out all the soil around the corner. That's how bad it. this was. And they replanted them with two new fully grown. Well, not fully grown, but you know, they were, they're, they're pretty, they mean, they're full grown, but not, you know, as magical old. or old as the original ones. Okay. Yeah. So they replaced them with other Southern live oak trees an Auburn official says that there were no danger to humans, but they were concerned that the um, herbicide would spread to the soil from the soil to the other trees and shrubs in the area. But I, mm. they didn't. So okay, good. To make matters worse, the trees were already fragile for a number of reasons, it's like the original trees. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So they, I should just say that instead, right? So no, we're talking about okay. I don't know. We're talking about um, this. This part is about the original trees, not the new ones. Okay. Okay, so to make matters worse, the original trees were already fragile for a number of reasons. They live well north of their usual range, and they're on a busy street corner, and they're regularly covered in toilet paper. I was going to say, yeah, that's probably which like the biggest thing. Yeah, which isn't the best thing for them. Mm-mm. No nutrients from that. So that also, you know, the F, you know, helped kill them. 
Yeah. They were the healthiest trees. Let's just say that. Aww. They were kind of like little twig trees that, oh, no. you know, they were full grown and they had leaves and everything, but they weren't the healthiest ones, right? They were yeah. eating Big Macs instead of salads every day or something. Okay. Okay. Use, let's just use that example. Okay. So, students and fans gathered together in Toomer's Corner to celebrate and mourn the oaks and enroll them one last time before the poison trees were removed in 2013. Mm. I saw pictures where people put, like, I love you and, like, we will miss you, oak trees, like, written on toilet paper and, like, put them, (laughs) like, as, like, a grave, sort of, like, you know. It is actually really sad, even though it's trees, but it's also, like... You know, a moment in time mm-hmm. that you're missing because you won't be able to do that again and celebrate with your yeah. It's sad. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so in 2016, some new oak trees came to be planted in Tumor's Corner, and Tumor's Corner is now sort of restored, but not restore restored to its former glory. And for Harvey, well, his son Bear Updike told AL.com that his father in 2020. Um, who also was a retired Texas State trooper, died of natural causes. So Harvey passed away. Yep. So the moral of the story, keep the trees out of it. (laughs) Honestly, (laughs) keep living things out of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. I'm kind of surprised it took several years to get new ones, though. Like, wouldn't you think you want to, like, within, like, a year or so? Maybe it was the soil. Maybe the soil was so... I don't know. I mean true that could have been it's just they a long process to... and now there are like they've added a lot more security oh i'm sure to, yeah yeah lock that tree those trees down <laughs> and also they're not allowed they can't be rolled oh. they're too young to be rolled i don't know oh, okay. as of like 2022 if they can be rolled yet but okay it'd be kind of funny if they made like fake trees just put them out there for like celebrations like, <laughs> like those um like 5g towers that they have in yeah. arizona where they try to make it like a pine tree those are bad I'm those sorry, are those funny are really <laughs> that, that should be tumor's corner new one 5g you know like a wi-fi tower or something yeah. That's great. Yeah, that's All right. Great. So some sources that I used were Bleacher Report, Sports Illustrated, Business Insider, Wikipedia, Mobituaries, which is a great podcast, and Ooh. AL.com. Nice. Thank you, Kendra, for educating us on the sports. Like the it was the just college sports. sports. <laughs> yeah. The sports. The it was sports. just college football. That's wrong. <laughs> oh man. What'd you think? <laughs> It's interesting because, like, I'm not, like, well-versed at all in any sports, especially not rivalries, except mm-hmm. for Packers and Vikings because mm-hmm. I see that every day. Mm-hmm. I literally had, like, two coworkers bickering over, yeah. like, Vikings and Packers today, and I was like, oh, my goodness. But, yeah, it's interesting because there's, there's a lot of interesting feuds and stuff, but this is taking it a to the too next. Far level <laughs> yeah this like is the, when fanatics is it's just, it's fanatics instead of fans yeah exactly this is like a danger level yep yeah. okay katrina you have to choose hmm. alabama or auburn you must and you must choose i must choose mm-hmm. i'm gonna say auburn just because it's a cool name i'm gonna say <laughs> i'm gonna say alabama yeah, alabama and i'm okay. gonna take a quote from harvey updike okay. roll damn tide <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what does that mean it's like their chant. They say roll tide roll. Roll tide roll. See, As, like I, I I know like that's what they say, but like I don't know what it the means. The crimson right tide is rolling. It is rolling to crush you with this crimson, oh, I think. Okay. Which is really I don't understand it. Their mascot <laughs> No, no, this is I understand that, but I don't understand this. Their mascot is an elephant and then like it's like crimson tide and it's I don't get it. Like um here, I'm gonna see if what does Crimson Tide mean. Hold on. I'm scared. What's it gonna be? I mean, is it like blood? Is that what that is? No, it's too dark. Uh, That's way too dark. Let's see. <laughs> it is blood. No. Okay, so here's the thing. For the from... Bible Belt, this is dark. Okay, so here's what it says from NCAA.com. Okay, so it says former. Birmingham Age Herald sports editor Hugh Doc Roberts is credited with giving Alabama its nickname, according to the University of Alabama Athletics website. After watching Alabama and rival Auburn play a six to six tie in Birmingham in November 1907, Roberts reportedly described described the game as Crimson Tide. That's after the Aub- last game that they played. Yeah, 
after Auburn was expected to win, but Alabama played its rival to a muddy, uh, sorry, played its rival to a draw in muddy conditions. The phrase Crimson Tide was a fairly common descriptor back then in regards to life or blood, often within the context of war or poetry. As a bloody so battle. their nickname comes from their rivalry as well. Yes, it does. It's deep rooted, <laughs> <laughs> deep seated. <laughs> That's nuts. Okay. <sighs> yep. All right. <laughs> I'm glad that men play the play that game and not women because if women played and it was called Crimson Tide, <laughs> it'd be different meaning for the blood. Just a little bit, yeah. Yep. All right, Wanderers, thank you so much for listening to another Foolish Wanderers podcast. We hope you enjoyed. If you have any suggestions for any future episodes, please feel free to email us at fwplisteners at gmail.com. And as always, new episodes of the FWP are released weekly from wherever you get your podcast from, including this place that you're listening to right now. Yes, yes, yes. And if you'd like, we would really appreciate it if you'd consider leaving us a five-star review. And we appreciate all of our Wanderers, and thank you for listening. Yes, thank you so much, Wanderers, and we'll see you guys next time. Kendra has only eight toenails instead of ten. <laughs>